Now, Tim is a historian and hacker who researches the possibilities and politics of digital cultural collections. Tim has worked across the cultural heritage sector and has been developing online resources relating to libraries, archives, museums, and history since 1993. He is Associate Professor of Digital Heritage at the University of Canberra and was also until recently Manager of Trove at the National Library of Australia. In previous lives, Tim has written on weather, progress and the atomic age and developed resources including Wright Sparks and mapping our Anzacs. Relatively late in the day, he discovered two things, that he was only really happy when he was making and sharing code and that he was part of a field called the Digital Humanities. These discoveries changed his life. Tim's tools and experiments include important things like the real face of white Australia, useful things like query pick, and follies like the future of Australia past. Um, he enjoys the messiness of cultural data and the possibilities of connecting things up. He worries about surveillance and possibilities of connecting... Oh, I've, no, no, never mind. That's doubling up there. Somebody, some spies got into the system and edited my words. Tim tries to share his passions by raving on about stuff like APIs, linked open data, and facial detection. He's a proud organiser of That Camp Canberra and a member of That Camp Council. You can find him online at discontents.com.au and I'm sure many of you already follow his Twitter handle which is always full of exciting stuff, as is Tim himself. So, I think we're all ready, so let's uh, please welcome to the stage Tim Sherratt. Thanks, Julia, um, and hello everybody. Um, I have worked across the cultural heritage sector, but um, if I always say that I'm really an archives person, uh, and this is not my first ASA conference, so I'm very glad to be back here amongst friends. Um, I just quickly tweeted the links to my slides today. Um, so they're online, and as you'll see, they're sort of playable. Um, so uh, please, if you've got your devices with you, log on and uh, follow along. Okay, let's start somewhere familiar with Record Search, the National Archives of Australia's database. This is Record Search, but not as you know it. Uh, this is my hacked version of Record Search. Unlike the regular version, it displays the number of pages in each file, but more interestingly, if you search in series ST84 slash 1, you see more than metadata. You see the people inside. As Barbara Reed noted in her article, Reinventing Access, records are imbued with people. Series ST84 slash 1 goes by the fairly benign title Certificates of Domicile and Certificates of Exemption from Dictation Test Chronological Series. But of course, the dictation test was the administrative backbone of a racist system designed to exclude people who did not fit the widely accepted vision of white Australia. ST84 slash 1 is full of people just trying to live their lives under the weight of the white Australia policy. The certificates in ST84-1 <clears throat> allowed people born or resident in Australia to return home after travelling overseas. If your whiteness was suspect and you had no certificate, you would be subjected to the dictation test and you would fail. The certificates usually include photographs and handprints and they are, as you can see, compelling and confronting documents. But you have to dig through layers of metadata in record search in order to see that. Or do you? About five years ago, Kate Bagnall, a historian of Chinese Australia, and I were thinking about ways of drawing attention to these records. In a little over a weekend, I harvested about 12,000 page images from record search uh, from ST84-1 and ran them through a facial detection script. The result was the real face of white Australia.
There's about 7,000 faces, so you can scroll for a long time. You may have seen it before. Um, it's had quite a remarkable life. Uh, Travelling around the world is an example of how we can use digital tools to see records differently. But of course, the power is in the faces themselves, in the connections we make through time. We cannot escape their discomforting gaze. Now, you might think that the certificates in ST84-1 are merely a form of identity document. But remember that the, in early years of the 20th century, passports were still evolving. And the use of photographs and fingerprints for identification were generally confined to prisoners and criminals. The sociologist Richard Jenkins talk, talks about identity not as an essence or a noun, but as something that we do, a process of identification. But self-identification is self-constrained by broader systems of categorization, of social sorting, that decide who belongs, who is a threat, and who needs to be watched. The records in ST84-1 were embedded within a system of surveillance that extended outwards from Australia's ports to the offices of shipping companies around the world and inwards to anyone who seemed out of place in white Australia. Technologies of identification and surveillance do not simply enforce boundaries, they create them. Their existence demonstrates why they are needed. These records did not document identity, they defined it according to a set of racial categories. Modern parallels are not hard to find. Last year in a bungled operation that became famously known as Border Farce, immigration officials planned to prowl the streets of Melbourne in the hunt for illegal immigrants. The focus of border surveillance once again turned inwards to those who seemed out of place. Watching in horror as these events unfolded on social media, I helpfully pointed people in Melbourne to a convenient source of identity documents. The, uh, the link I tweeted was not to record search, but to an experimental interface uh, that Kate and I are continuing to uh, use to think about ways of exposing the bureaucratic remnants of white Australia. <coughs> So far, I've harvested metadata from around 20,000 files and downloaded around 150,000 page images. Amongst other things, I'm working on an updated wall of faces. Most recently, um, I, uh, I worked um, out a way of uh, viewing files by their page orientation. By the ratio of height to width. Why would I do that? Well, Kate wanted an easy way of, of finding birth certificates, which in this period uh, tended to be short and wide. So it was a simple little hack, but it revealed the records in a, in a very different sort of way, as you can see. There's a big bunch of birth certificates in there, um, but there's also other sorts of stuff, like envelopes and photographs and notes, um, various sorts of slips. And it makes you think about how we see the written world through the sort of frames of portrait orientation. It's perhaps also worth noting that record search displays thumbnails as cropped squares. The shape is, is uh, subsumed to the regularity of the grid. The records in our landscape view are no more accessible than they were before, but they can be accessed differently. In his contribution to the ASA's 30th anniversary symposium, Eric Ketelaar described the relationship between archival access and human rights, highlighting the importance of access not only to democratic accountability, but also to our rights as victims of official surveillance. He says, 
As human beings subjected to the panoptic sort of governments and private enterprise, we have the right to know. Kedlar concludes by stating, by stating that access is not the actual use of archives, access enables use. I'd like to extend that a bit because what my own work really reveals is the complex relationship between access and use. Not only does access enable use, use changes what we mean by access. My bio nowadays describes me as historian and hacker. Historian describes my orientation to the world. I see the past in the present. Hacker refers to the tools that I use to make connections through time. Hacking is creative and positive, despite what the mainstream media might say. It's about finding solutions, exploring alternatives, and pushing the limits of what's possible. My record search hack is just a little piece of JavaScript code that you or anybody can install in their browser. It changes the pages as they load. User scripts, as these sorts of things are called, allow anyone to alter the behavior, of, uh, alter the way that web pages look and behave within their own browser. They give users greater control over their online experience, but they also open opportunities for experimentation. A lot of my own research is guided, like Christians, uh, guided by questions like, what would happen if I, um, or what would it look like, or uh, what would change, or maybe what would I feel? User scripts are one way of playing around with some of the complexities of access. Now, surveillance too can be hacked, and if you're concerned about technologies such as facial detection, you'll be pleased to know that thanks to the work of artist Adam Harvey, not only can you confuse detection algorithms, you can make a dramatic fashion statement. <laughs> Gary Marx, who's a, who's a major figure in the field of surveillance studies, has catalogued the ways in which individuals can resist the growing encroachments of surveillance. Amongst possible tactics, he identifies discovery, the attempt to uncover the scope of surveillance. Access to records can empower such acts of everyday resistance. But in other ways, surveillance and access are more alike than opposed. Both start from a place of concealment. Access cannot be given unless it is first restricted. Both depend on asymmetries of power. Decisions about what we can know are ultimately made by others. Access is as much a process of control as it is an act of release. But this is not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I think we can all agree there should be limits to access, particularly relating to individual privacy and cultural sensitivity. But just as identity is defined through acts of identification, so access is elaborated through instances of deployment and use. Access is not a state of being, it's a process to be negotiated. And so the question is, what can we know about what we can know? On the 1st of January this year, I harvested the metadata of all the files in record search with the access status of closed. You can grab the data set here if you'd like it. These are records that the access examination process has determined should be withheld from public scrutiny. While the files themselves can't be seen, of course, record search does tell us a fair bit about them including when the decision was made to close them and the reasons behind it. Unfortunately, you can't search or filter on this data, so it's difficult to look for patterns within record search itself. So I've taken the data and loaded it into a new site, 
where you can examine it from a number of different angles. You can explore the reasons why files were closed. Um, you can look at the series that they came from, uh, the age of the contents, and the dates when decisions were made about them. It's more of a workbench than a discovery interface. Um, and it's likely to change as I start to ask different questions about the data. Of course, the outlines of the examination process, including the grounds for exemption, are defined by the Archives Act. So what more is there to know? Section 33 of the Archives Act does indeed spell out 17 reasons why records can be withheld from public access. But the data in record search, now these are the reasons extracted from record search, includes an additional 11 categories. Um, some like Parliament Class A relate to other uh, definitions under the Act. Others, uh, like um, everybody's favourite, uh, which is make your selection, um, <laughs> tell us something about the record search interface. Uh, but two of the most heavily cited reasons down the bottom here, um, pre-access recorder, and withheld pending advice are not defined under the Act um, or indeed uh, really anywhere that I could find on the Archives website. But of course, being an archivally educated audience, you probably already know what these labels refer to. But if you need a little help, you can uh, look in detail at each of these access decisions um, and uh, each of these access categories and see when decisions about them were made. So each of the reasons has its own little summary here, which you can slice and dice from different angles. Uh, and if we look at when the access decisions were made about, uh, this is the pre-access recorder ones, we can see here, these are the dates that the decisions were made. We can see that most of the decisions were actually made before the Archives Act was introduced. So there's 1983 with the Archives Act, and we can see the bulk of the decisions here with a peak in 1974. Um, so, I mean, I, I checked with the archives um, and they confirmed that these were records uh, that were examined before the existence of the Act. Um, and they explained the pre-access recorder was used when the original exemptions uh, couldn't be mapped to those later defined under Section 33. Conversely, uh, if we look at withheld pending advice, we can see that um, most of the decisions on those have been made within the last few years, last five or six years. Um, and if you look at the series containing these, uh, the, which uh, cite these reasons, we can see that most of them uh, almost half come from one series, uh, A1838, which is DFAT's main correspondence series. You already know the punchline, don't you? Yeah. So, yes, as I'm sure you realise, these are files which have been referred back to agencies for advice. Uh, and DFAT has been particularly slow in responding. Um, they're listed as closed on record search even though their access status has not been finalised. Um, they're not, however, included in the count of closed files that the archives reports in its uh, annual summary of access statistics, uh, which I discovered when I tried to sort of match up the data from my own database, which is in the orange lines there, and the blue, which is the stats from the annual report. Um, this is probably fair enough, but if you search the closed files, and my interface does allow you to do any sort of search on numerous uh, fields on those files, you can see that 1,467 of them have been waiting for more than three years for a final decision. They might not be officially or finally closed, but for a PhD student wanting to see them, they are effectively closed. Now, my point here is not to be critical of the National Archives or even of DFAT. Um, 
what I'm interested in is in the inevitable gap between legislation and practice. Access examination is subject to a range of influences and constraints, resourcing, of course, um, high amongst them. And it needs to be understood not as the application of a set of rules, but as a process that is itself historically contingent, a human process. Earlier this year, I harvested several gigabytes of parliamentary proceedings from the Australian Parliament's Parlinfo database and created my own version of historic Hansard, as you do. In the process of harvesting the files, I discovered that data was actually missing for about 100 sitting days, um, most of them from the Senate between 1912 and 1919. Um, to put that in context, uh, on average is about 50 sitting days a year, so effectively it's sort of two years worth of, of sittings. Um, this is, uh, shows you where the missing bits are in the Senate. Um, so those red bits are the ones that are missing. So you can see in 1917, uh, there's about 21 sitting days missing. There's no conspiracy at work here. It's just some sort of processing error. However, Parliament staff weren't aware of the problem and it's unlikely that anyone would have noticed by using the web interface. I mean, you can't find what you can't find. Fortunately, Parliament staff are now working on a fix, but if you've been relying on Parliinfo for access to debates relating to World War I in particular, you might want to do a bit more checking. These things happen. Systems go wrong. Mistakes are made. Again, what interests me is not finding who's to blame, but exploring the gap between design and outcome, between ideal and reality. This is the gap where access is made and experienced. A gap that can only be understood through the complexities and contradictions of use. Access does not exist until its limits have been tested. It's not a process of opening, it's a constant ongoing struggle over the very meaning of open. And that's a good thing. We're here at this conference to explore the possibilities of, of forging links. But of course, collaborations don't have to be comfortable to be constructive. The struggle over access may sometimes be tense frustrating and annoying, but it's also productive. Users of archives don't just consume access, they create it. About a year ago, <clears throat> I fired up my record search harvester again and downloaded the metadata and page images for most of the ASIO files publicly available through the National Archives. I ended up with about 70 gigabytes worth of images. These are mostly dossiers on individuals and organisations. And if you've ever looked at them, you'll see that they're quite odd collections of gossip, of published articles, and of course, records of surveillance. I've made this data available to anybody who wants it. Um, and some of the images were recently used in the GovHack open data competition to create the Cute Commies site. Now, to be honest, I didn't have a clear purpose in mind when I harvested the data. It was another one of those what would happen if sort of moments. I was, however, gen thinking generally about possible points of comparison between the ASIO files and the archival remnants of the White Australia policy. Both built systems of identification, classification and surveillance within which record keeping was crucial. Kate and other historians of Chinese Australia have noted that the administration of the White Australia policy was not uniform or consistent. <coughs> Similar cases could result in quite different outcomes, depending on the location and those involved. 
Understanding this is important, not only for documenting the workings of the system, but for recovering the agency of those subjected to it. Non-white residents were not mere victims. They found ways of negotiating and even manipulating the state's racist bureaucracy. In her work on colonial archives, Anne Laura Stoller identifies this disjuncture between prescription and practice, between state mandates and the manoeuvres people make in response to them as part of the ethnographic space of the archive. How do we explore this space? One of the things I've found interesting in working with the closed files is the way we can use the available metadata to show us what we can't see. It's like creating a negative image of access. Kate and I have been thinking for a number of years about how we might use digital tools to mine the White Australia records for traces, gaps and shadows that together build a picture of the policy in action. Who knew who? Who was where and when? What records remain and why? The workings of ASIO, on the other hand, are deliberately obscured. Many of the files uh, in the archives include notes like this, explaining why details have been withheld. Some warn that the public disclosure of information concerning the procedures and techniques used by ASIO would enable people of interest to formulate countermeasures based on an analysis of ASIO modus operandi. David Horner's recent history of ASIO notes that he was required to remove ASIO file references from his footnotes because of the nature of ASIO's filing system, which itself is classified. <laughs> we don't even know how many files ASIO has on people and organisations, although David McKnight suggests that it's somewhere in the hundreds of thousands. My harvest includes about 12,000 files. Just like systems of racial classification, intelligence services exist within a circle of self-justification. The fact that they exist proves they need to exist. We are denied information that might enable us to imagine alternatives. And yet, as limited as the provisions under the Archives Act are for access to, uh, to ASIO files, we do have access. How can we use this narrow, shuttered window to reverse the gaze of state surveillance and rebuild a context that has been deliberately erased? Just as with closed access and the White Australia records, can we give meaning to the gaps and the absences? Can we see what's not there? This is one of the questions being explored by Columbia University's History Lab. Um, they've created the Declassification Engine, which is a huge database of, of previously classified government documents that they're using to analyse the nature of official secrecy. By identifying non-redacted copies of previously redacted documents, they've also been able to track the words, concepts and events which are most likely to be censored. The History Lab's collection of documents on foreign policy and world events is rather different to, to ASIO's archive of the lives, habits and beliefs of ordinary Australians. But I'm hoping that they too can tell us something about the culture that created them. Now, I intended today to have this sort of wonderfully compelling set of sweets and examples and arguments to demonstrate, but time has run short and my ambitions are always a bit too over the top. But instead, I have a collection of, uh, of half-baked experiments, uh, which nonetheless hopefully shows something a bit interesting. But anyway, perhaps that's better. You know, it's important to me to try and be open about my own processes. I share all my code and my data, um, and I've started documenting most of what I'm up to in an open research notebook. 
If access is a struggle, then we should be sharing our stories of loss and frustration and not simply celebrating our victories. Now, uh, most of these experiments are online in some form, so please explore and play with them. So experiment A is really just nothing more than a browse interface to the digitised files that I've harvested. Um, and it's just a clone, in effect, of the, wider, the, the work that I've done with the White Australia records. Um, but nonetheless, I still think there's real power in just the ability to browse, um, that ability to see the complete contents of a file on a page um, offers something that we don't get in other ways. There's a familiar name for you. So all the digitised files that I've downloaded are available and accessible there. Experiment D B started with a problem. From record search, I could harvest data on an access status. So I could find out how many ASIO files were in each of the three categories. Open, open with exception, and closed. Good. But how much of the open with exception files was actually open? You know, pages can be removed, things can be blacked out. Most of the uh, files include a form of this sort of type, which is headed off the screen, which tell you how many pages have been completely or partially exempted. So what's been removed or um, redacted within the file. That's great. That's really useful. But did I really want to open up 12,000 files and manually scan them for all the summaries? Um, by playing around with the Tesseract OCR engine, optical character recognition engine, um, I've created a simple filter uh, that extracts text from the images and searches for words like exemption, archives, and folio. Um, and as a result of that, I now have a, a good sized collection of these sorts of pages sitting in a folder waiting for me to do some data entry. Experiment C began as another attempt to try and quantify the scale of exemption. So these sorts of summaries could tell me how many pages had redactions. Um, redactions, you know, bits of information like names and IDs that are, that are blacked out of the page. Sometimes uh, they're even cut out of the page. But if I could identify those individual redactions, I could both test these summaries and create a new measure of openness or redactedness or whatever. Through trial and error, <coughs> I developed a computer vision script that did a pretty good job of finding redactions in page images. Despite many variations in redaction style, in paper colour, and in print quality. <coughs> it took a couple of days to work through the 300,000 page images. But in the end, I had a collection of about 300,000 individual redactions. Unfortunately, about 20% of those were false positives. So I spent a number of nights manually sorting the results. Um, yes, this is the glamorous life of the archives hacker. Dragging and dropping until your wrist gets very sore. Now, my redaction finder still needs a lot of refinement. And plenty of errors have still slipped through. But within the files that are currently digitised, the scale of um, exemption seems about 10 times greater um, than, than Margaret Kenner estimated when giving evidence to the Parliamentary Joint Committee on ASIO in 2000. Um, she thought then that every file contained about 10 exemptions. Uh, as she said, be it a word or a folio or a paragraph. Um, and I'm currently seeing an average of about 100 redactions per file. That may be skewed by uh, a small number of files which have like thousand redactions. Um, I will see once I get the data all in. I've started adding information about the size and position of redactions to my database and aggregating this data by page. When I left Canberra yesterday, 
my script was still running. Uh, it had taken a lot longer than I thought. Um, but you can at least uh, start to explore the current standings in my lists of, of uh, most redacted pages and uh, files. So this data isn't going to be complete yet, um, but you can see most redacted page at the moment. Um, let's see where we are with the, uh, the files with the most number of redactions. No, the most the average per page. Let's see the average per page. Lots of little redactions in that one. So you can start to play around with these, as I say, aggregated by file and by page. <coughs> Once this data processing is completed, you'll be able to filter files by the amount of area blacked out in them or by the total number of redactions. Many more opportunities for you to see what you can't see. Experiment D was an attempt to build a composite image of all the redactions in order to visualise what parts of a page were most likely to be removed. Something like a heat map, if you know what that is. It sort of worked, um, but by the time I'd added all the redactions, uh, Um, I had a very large black blob. Um, that was only 170,000 in. It was actually went up to 230,000. So there's another 60,000 got added on top of that. But you can, I did, I was saving these images after every thousand. Um, and as you go through up until about, I don't know, uh, 20,000 or something, you can actually see patterns where bit, you know, certain bits are most likely to be redacted. But obviously I need a bit of a rethink uh, in the way I approach this. Experiment E had two aims. First, to highlight the visual character of the redactions themselves. I mean, there's a strange sort of beauty in these collections of blobs and boxes. And secondly, just as with the real face of White Australia, I wanted to turn these files inside out. Instead of being dead ends, I wanted the redactions to be discovery points, signposts, ways of exploring the files. That's a random selection of, uh, I think it's 100 redactions. You get a different lot every time you load the page. If you'd like to find out where they come from, you just click on one of them. I can't quite see it there, but it shows you the page in which it comes from. So you can actually go through, open up the page, see the context of that redaction. Hours of fun. <laughs> it's online, you can go play with it. As I said, that is a view, that view shows you a random sample um, of uh, redactions, but you can also, if you really want to, um, Browse through the entire 230,000 redactions page by page. Uh, and see these because these are <coughs> being grouped by their file. And we get the sort of changes in paper type and uh, redaction style. Um, so if you're a connoisseur of redactions, <laughs> um, you can appreciate the, uh, the differences. I find it rather hypnotic. <laughs> B 
Talking about her own ASIO file in the book Dirty Secrets, the politician and academic Meredith Bergman noted that the blacking out process seems totally arbitrary and for the reader, terribly frustrating, like reading a detective novel with the last page torn out. But in hunting for redactions, I found they could also bring moments of unexpected joy. It seems that someone got a bit bored and has left us with a glorious collection of redaction art. Uh, if anybody in the audience is responsible for these, please tell me later. Uh, I think it's fabulous. <laughs> Ships, as you can see, particularly popular. Um, again, you can explore the, the context of all of these. So, what's to come? I need to rework my redaction finder to improve its accuracy. It's interesting and perhaps somewhat ironic that the removal of information has actually given me an identifiable data point that I can potentially track against other characteristics of the files. Can I identify uh, patterns by time or topic? for example. Um, apparently ASIO assessments have become less conservative over the years. I can test this. I can look at changes in redaction rates over time, comparing them to the dates of access decisions. I also want to explore the context of redactions by expanding the window around each of these redactions and OCRing the result I hope to identify words that most commonly occur near redactions. Those of you who are coming along to the workshop on Friday will hear more about some of the tools and technologies that I've used in these experiments. But I wanted to give a brief overview today because this is access. Digital tools and technologies give us the opportunity to use databases like Record Search as archaeological sites, to sift through the layers of metadata in search of new connections and meanings. This is access. We can turn digitized collections inside out, revealing the people, the processes, the structures, the form. This is access. We can reveal the processes through which records are controlled, concealed, and withheld. This is access. Access is not a deliverable or a product. It's a struggle for understanding and power. Not just to see, but to see differently. This is record search, but not as you know it. Experiment F is a user script that puts the redactions back into record search. Access is an honest acknowledgement of its own limits and an invitation to push beyond. Thanks. <laughs>